You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a shop assistant. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning, Jenny's Suit Rental. Jenny speaking. How may I be of service? Hi there. My name is Max Jones. That's J-O-N-E-S. And I'm looking to rent a suit out for a special occasion. Certainly, Max. We charge a set fee for our services. You can either choose from our designer range and pay £50 to rent your suit out, or choose from our standard range at a cost of £25. So, what will it be? Oh, the first option, please, Jenny. Uh, £25, did you say? Unfortunately not. The designer range is twice that price. Oh, in that case, I'll take the second option. Uh, standard, was that it? That's right. Now, before we go any further, may I ask how you intend to pay? Do you accept cheques? Yes, but only in exceptional circumstances. We prefer cash or credit card. Well, as I haven't got one, does this count as uh, those circumstances? Yes, that'll be fine. Make it payable to Jenny's Suit Rental. Will do. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, Max, can I take your measurements, please, and a few details about what sort of suit you have in mind? Certainly. Let's start with the trousers, then, shall we? What is your waist size and leg length? I used to be 32 waist, you know, but these days it's more like 36. Too many cream pies. I've been there. And about the leg, 34? I wish. I'm afraid I'm somewhat lacking in the height department. Not even a 32. 30, I'm afraid. Never mind. As for the colour, could you do a dark grey suit? In fact, we have a very smart one of those in just your size. You're in luck. Now, what about shoes? Same colour? No, I think I prefer something darker. OK, let's go with traditional black then, shall we? What about size? Uh, I'm a size 45. Hmm... By my calculations, that's uh, 10 in our sizes. And style? What have you got? We do suede, nubuck and traditional leather. Definitely the last one. Very well. And will you be wanting a necktie? Do you do bow ties? Of course. I'll put one of those down on your order. Dark grey, I presume? Perfect. To match the suit. I think I fancy a light blue shirt, by the way. Might I recommend a green? Green would go very well with the suit you are renting. Light or dark? I'd say dark. Dark it is then. My next size is 17 and a half. Uh, hard to believe that a little over a year ago I could fit into a 15, isn't it? Those cream pies again, right? You got it. Now, what about your suit jacket? Same colour as the trousers, obviously, but what size? Medium should be fine. You sure? Yeah. And have you got any of those three-button ones? I'm afraid not. The one- and two-button suit jackets are far more popular at the moment. In fact, the one button is all the rage. Let's have that one, then. No problem. Now. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. You are going to hear a talk about making the most of graduate school. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Entrance to the graduate school. My job now is to give you the graduate school survival guide and make some concise suggestions for getting the most out of your relationship with our research supervisor, getting the most out of what you read, and making continual progress with your research. First, your relationship with your supervisor. This is fundamental. Meet regularly. You should expect to meet once a week or at least every other week because this will give you the motivation to make progress and also keeps your advisor aware of your work. Prepare for your meetings. Come to each meeting. Also, bring the notes from your previous meeting together with a list of any upcoming deadlines. Make a plan for what you hope to get out of each meeting. After the meeting, email your supervisor a brief summary. Include a list of major topics discussed, a list of what you agreed on, a note of any advice you may not want to follow, and a new summary of what you are planning to do. This helps avoid misunderstandings and provides a handy record of the progress of your research. Add a to-do list for yourself and your supervisor, including a reading list. Finally, add the time and date for the next meeting. My second main piece of advice is to keep your supervisor informed. Show him or her the results of your work as soon as possible. This helps your supervisor understand your research and identify any potential points of conflict early in the process. Include summaries of your work, including any results of experiments, and also anything you write about your research. Thirdly, communicate clearly. If you disagree with your advisor, state your objections and concerns clearly and calmly. If you feel that something about your relationship is not working, discuss it with him or her. Whenever possible, suggest steps that they could take to address your concerns. Under this heading, it is extremely important to take the initiative. You do not need to clear everything you do in your research with your advisor. He or she is busy too. You must be responsible for your own ideas and the progress of your work. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. The second section of my talk is about getting the most out of what you read. The first principle here is to be organized. Keep an electronic bibliography with notes and pointers to the paper files. Keep and file all the papers you have read. Point two, be efficient. Only read what you need to. Start by reading only the conclusion, scanning figures and tables, and looking at their references. Read the other sections only if the paper seems relevant or you think it might help you get a different perspective. Skip the sections you think you already understand. These are often the background and motivation sections. It's of critical importance to take good notes 
on every paper you find worth reading. Note especially what problem the author is trying to solve, what approach they take to the problem, and how their approach differs from other approaches. Next, summarize what you have read on each topic. After you have read several papers on the same topic, note the key problems, the various formulations of the problem under consideration, the relationship between the various approaches and the alternative approaches you come across. Let me add one point you might not have already thought of. Read PhD theses. Even though they are long, they can be very helpful for quickly learning about what has been done in your field of interest. Focus particularly on the background sections and method sections. Don't forget to read your advisor's thesis. This will give you an idea of what he or she expects from you. The third section of my talk is about making continual progress with your research. Keep a journal of your ideas. Write down every issue you are thinking about, even if you think it is stupid. This will help you keep track of your progress and keep you from going round in circles. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Richard Murray, a zoologist and popular TV personality, has been giving a talk on endangered species of wildlife to members of the Young Conservationists Association in a small town in the south of England. Listen to the extract from the discussion he had with two of the young people after his talk. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. What would you say, Mr Murray, are the main reasons that so much of our wildlife will have died out by the end of the next few decades? Well, Tony, we can't, of course, rule out the effect of urbanisation due to the spread of population. But apart from that, I believe there are two reasons which in a way, are like the opposite ends of a piece of string. If you tie a knot in that piece of string, you end up with a circle, and whichever way you go round, it's going to turn out to be the same. I don't think I quite get that, Mr Murray. Well, let's put it another way. It's rather like a film. You've got the good guys and the bad guys. They're pulling in opposite directions, but when it comes to the final showdown... It's hard to make out which is which. What are your two reasons, Mr Murray? I call them greed and caring. Greed and caring? Yes, I know they don't seem to have much to do with one another, but think about it. The motive of greed is pretty obvious. In the course of the next few months, thousands of baby seals will be bludgeoned to death before they're even weaned from their mothers. What for? For the sale of their skins at inflated prices to please the vanity of a few and line the pockets of the killers. Crocodiles will be slaughtered to provide shoes and handbags for the rich. Grillers, tigers, leopards and rhinos will be hunted for senseless sport or poached in defiance of regulations. Their skins, their horns and their magnificent heads will be used as trophies 
to decorate someone's living room floor or walls. That's terrible. Yes, but it's not all. The whale, probably the most impressive and certainly one of the most intelligent sea mammals in creation, will be cruelly hunted and harpooned to make more money for the profiteers. The dolphin, the sailor's friend, will be indiscriminately battered to death at so much ahead on the grounds that it is taking away the livelihood of a few fishermen by consuming the fish in its natural habitat. But surely, Mr. Murray, we do have to keep warm. We need whale oil and ambergris. Fishermen have to make a living. Part of what you say is true, of course, Tony, but we shall have to enforce far stricter controls if future generations are not to find themselves in a world devoid of wildlife as we know it. Well, I see what you mean about fur coats and crocodile handbags, Mr. Murray, but I don't understand what you mean by caring. That can't be bad, surely. I mean, I thought we were supposed to be living in a caring society. Well, so we do, in a way. The trouble is, there are so many well-intentioned people who start out with the best possible motives of trying to protect or immunise us from this, that or the other in the most effective way at the quickest possible rate. But in their enthusiasm, they lose sight of the long-term consequences. It's only very gradually that the danger to other forms of life, including humans, comes out. Not to say leaks out, and by that time it'll probably be too late to do much about it. Take insecticides, for instance. But insect... Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. But insecticides protect crops from pets. They destroy disease-carrying mites and creepy crawlies like cockroaches. True, but nature has a way of developing her own immunity against insecticides and other pest controls, with the result that the biologists are driven to inventing stronger and stronger compounds, which though they may annihilate the pest, nevertheless permeate the environment, are assimilated by plant and animal life, and become absorbed by the soil. Countless innocent creatures, the beaver or the mole, for example, are performing a useful task in the natural control. The alarming prospect is that as these poisons enter the foods we eat, and consequently our own systems, They'll find their way into the body of the pregnant mother and into her milk, offering incalculable risks to the unborn or newly born infant. In spite of all our technological expertise, our time is running out. We're virtually destroying ourselves. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an environmental studies student giving a presentation about his project on saving an endangered species of plant. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40.
For my presentation, I'm going to summarise what I've found out about efforts to save one plant species, the juniper bush. It once flourished in Britain and throughout the world's temperate zones, but over the last few decades has declined considerably. Before I go on to explain the steps being taken to save it in England, let me start by looking at some background information and why the juniper has been so important in cultural as well as ecological terms, historically and in the present day. Firstly, I want to emphasise the fact that juniper is a very ancient plant. It has been discovered that it was actually amongst the first species of plants to establish itself in Britain in the period following the most recent Ice Age. And, as I say, it has a much valued place in British culture. It was used widely as a fuel during the Middle Ages because when burnt, the smoke given off is all but invisible and so any illicit activities involving fire could go on without being detected. For example, cooking game hunted illegally. It also has valuable medicinal properties. Particularly during large epidemics, oils were extracted from the juniper wood and sprayed in the air to try to prevent the spread of infection in hospital wards. And these days, perhaps its most well-known use is in cuisine, cooking, where its berries are a much-valued ingredient, used to flavour a variety of meat dishes and also drinks. Turning now to ecological issues, juniper bushes play an important role in supporting other living things. If juniper bushes are wiped out, this would radically affect many different insect and also fungus species. We simply cannot afford to let this species die out. So, why is the juniper plant declining at such a rapid rate? Well, a survey conducted in the north and west of Britain in 2004-5 showed that a major problem is the fact that in present-day populations, ratios between the sexes are unbalanced and without a proper mix of male and female, bushes don't get pollinated. Also, the survey found that in a lot of these populations, the plants are the same age, so this means that bushes grow old and start to die at similar times, leading to swift extinction of whole populations. Now, the charity Plant Life is trying to do something to halt the decline in juniper species. It's currently trying out two new major salvage techniques, this time focusing on lowland regions of England. The first thing it's trying is to provide shelters for the seedlings in areas where juniper populations are fairly well established. These, of course, are designed to help protect the plants at their most vulnerable stage. A further measure is that in areas where colonies have all but died out, numbers are being bolstered by the planting of cuttings which have been taken from healthy bushes elsewhere. Now, I hope I've given a clear picture of the problems facing this culturally and ecologically valuable plant and of the measures being taken by plant life to tackle them. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.